Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and also for, uh, I would like to thank all the organizers for inviting me to this nice event. I want to speak about uh, the relation between quantum field theory and gravitation. So uh, this is based on joint work with Romeo Brunetti, Michael Dutsch, and Katarzyna Reisner. Now, uh, uh, we all know that uh, the problem of relating quantum theory and gravitation is a long-standing issue, around 100 years old, and without a definite solution until now. In spite of the fact that quantum physics is a well-established theory with a uh, lot of uh, nice uh, verifications, uh, in particular also in elementary particle physics, where, of course, the mathematical status is not as good as in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> but... Uh, nevertheless, it's uh, applied with great success to experiments in elementary particle physics. And uh, on the other side, also gravitation is nowadays well established as a classical theory. There's a lot of experimental uh, confirmations, but we have not yet a consistent theory which combines both theories. Now here in my talk, I want to approach this problem from a rather conservative point of view, namely from the point of view of quantum field theory. And so the first step is then to uh, uh, look at quantum field theory under the influence of external gravitational field, which mathematically means that you have to study quantum field theory on generic uh, Lorentzian manifolds. And I will then discuss uh, in which sense uh, this can be also used for including perturbative uh, quantum gravity. Uh, so when you start to, to define quantum field theory and curved backgrounds, in the first moment one might think that this is a very simple problem because in classical field theory, Everything is defined in terms, in geometric terms, and so it's rather easy to uh, formulate uh, classical field theory on generic manifolds. For instance, in electrodynamics, you just need the notion of differential forms, exterior differential, and we need the, the uh, Hodge dual to define the co-differential. On the right? Yes. Ah, yeah. So, and, uh, so you see uh, you need only very, very few things, just that you have a differential manifold and that you have a metric which is then used to define the Hodge dual. Now, when you try to do something similar with quantum field theory, you see that the standard <coughs> formulation of quantum field theory uses a lot of other structures. Namely, you define the concept of particles in terms of irreducible representations of the Poincaré group. You assume that there exists a distinguished state, the vacuum, which is defined as a state where all particles are absent. We have as a main physical observable the S matrix, which describes the uh, transition from incoming to outgoing particle configurations. And we use as a technical uh, mean the, the momentum representation, which is, due to, uh, which is possible due to the translation invariance. And uh, as another tool, we use the transition to imaginary time so that we get uh, a theory on uh, Euclidean space. And when one tries to, do, uh, uh, to uh, put quantum field theory on a curved background, you see that none of these features is uh, present. So there is, in, in the generic case, the group of space-time symmetries is trivial. So there is no useful concept of particles on a curved space-time. 
Therefore, there is also not a notion of a state with a particle, so the vacuum is no longer a valid concept. The transition to imaginary terms, so that you can replace your Lorentzian manifold by a Riemannian manifold, is not uh, possible in general. You cannot do calculations on momentum space, and if you just close your eyes and you, you write down Feynman graphs, then you meet the problem that there is no unique definition of a Feynman propagator. Oh. Uh, and uh, actually, these theoretical obstacles are then seen in, in some, some effects. What was uh, uh, first observed was that there is a phenomenon of particle creation. So in free theories, you might find the definition, what you call a particle, but then you see that this depends on the choice of a Cauchy surface. So when you change your Cauchy surface, then you get a different particle number. So you have particle creation from Cauchy surface to Cauchy surface, and actually even infinite amounts of particle creation. So this is, shows that the particle concept is not meaningful. And there's this phenomenon of Hawking radiation, so that if you look at a collapsing star and you start from a state which is sufficiently regular, then you see that asymptotically the state develops thermal radiation. And even on Minkowski space, you have this problem. If you look at an accelerated observer, and then you see some thermal properties of the state, the so-called Unruh effect. Hmm. So, in order to define quantum field theory in a curved space-time, it's uh, important to decouple those features which are geometrical from features which are non-geometrical. So, what are the geometrical features? These are field equations. These are commutation relations. So, uh, in general, these are the algebraic properties of the theory. And this uh, 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 forces one to use the formalism of algebraic quantum field theory as developed by Haag, Araki, and Kastler. S of course, these, uh, so you have uh, your, your physical quantities as elements of an abstract algebra. Of course, this algebra should admit representations on Hilbert space, but you don't use a specific representation. There is there is, however, one ingredient of Hilbert space representation which is very important for the structure in quantum field theory. This is the spectrum condition, the condition that the energy is positive. And so what you need in order to do this program is you have to find some local version of the spectrum condition. Okay, so this uh, is the plan of the lecture. So I will uh, give a few remarks on Lorentzian geometry and field equations. Then I will discuss quantization in the sense of deformation quantization. The uh, local version of the spectrum condition is uh, uh, imposed by using some tools for microlocal analysis. And then I will discuss how renormalization can be done in this framework, what the notion appropriate notion of covariance is, and uh, uh, I uh, discuss this on the example of a scalar field, but then I will indicate how this has to be generalized to include gauge theories and even gravity. Okay, so let me start with some basic notions. So we have a smooth manifold, which we call a space-time, and space-times in my uh, talk are always Lorentzian space-times, so the metric has Lorentzian signature. We have causal curves, which are tangent vectors, which are always time-like or light-like. We have time orientation, which is uh, imposed by choosing some nowhere vanishing time-like vector field. And so we can say when a, a curve is future-directed. And then we define the, the uh, future of some point X as a set of points Y, which uh, uh, can be reached from X by a future-directed causal curve. And in the analogous way, we can also define the path of a point. 
Now, uh, what is important for the following structure is the notion of global hyperbolicity. So space-time is called globally hyperbolic if it does not contain closed causal curves. And if for any two points, x and y, the intersection of the past of y and the future of x is a compact set. And the nice uh, feature of these globally hyperbolic uh, uh, space-times is that they have Cauchy surfaces, so hypersurfaces which are hit exactly once by each non-extendable causal curve. And they even have a foliation by Cauchy surfaces. So it's, uh, they have a rather simple structure, so they are uh, uh, diffeomorphic to a product of some manifold sigma times the real axis. In particular, globally hyperbolic manifolds are never compact. And the, uh, uh, for us, most important feature is that normally hyperbolic linear partial differential equations uh, have a well-posed Cauchy problem. In particular, they have unique retarded and advanced Green's functions. Actually, these properties of globally hyperbolic uh, spacetimes are around for quite some time, but the proofs are not so old. The, uh, the complete proofs are due to Bernal and Sanchez. But you find it already in older books, the same statements. Uh, <clears throat> now let's, uh, let's look at a simple example, the Klein-Gordon equation. And there we have the retarded and advanced propagators as maps from the space of uh, test functions with compact support to spaces of compact uh, of, of two smooth functions. So D is a space of uh, test function with compact support and E is a space of smooth functions. And they are uniquely determined as the inverses of the, uh, the Klein-Gordon operator and by the support conditions that the support of delta R F is contained in the future of the support of F and uh, vice versa with the, uh, advan uh, with the advanced propagator. Now what is uh, crucial for the structure is that uh, these two propagators are different. So we have a difference of these often called the causal propagator and later named the commutator function. And this will be crucial for the algebraic construction. Namely, in terms of this commutator function, you can define a bilinear form which is anti-symmetric, anti bilinear form on the test function space, and uh, which is degenerate, but uh, the degeneration is of a very simple form. Namely, uh, if you, uh, this, this form vanishes if one of the entries is in the image of the Klein Gordon operator applied to a test function. Uh, sorry, doesn't it look symmetric, the Laplacian or the, or the Laplacian? No, no, it's anti-symmetric because the adjoint of the, of the retarded propagator is the advanced propagator. So just if you take the adjoint, just the role of advanced and retarded changes. And because it was a difference, it changes the sign. No, it I mean, that's not the Laplace. Yeah, it was not the Laplace. Oh, it's not the Laplace operator. Oh, I, I'm sorry. It's not the Laplace operator. I'm sorry. This is a convention. It's a yeah, it's just a commutator function. No, no. Okay. Now, now this fact uh, that this is uh, anti-symmetric um, uh, can be used to define the Poisson bracket of classical field theory. It is just the following that the commutator the, the, the Poisson bracket of fields at points x and y is just these, uh, the integral kernel of this operator, so it's just this distribution delta of x, y. Just, so is it integral on x, or is it like f of x, and then the g of x, the g of y, like, um, like in the bottom, the second equation is the... No, no, delta, okay. Uh, the convention is that here, Oh, I'm sorry. Well, delta G is already yes, yes. an integral, yes. so it's yes. a double integral. Delta is an operator which uh, maps the test function to a, to a smooth function. And the result is again a function of x. 
Yeah, so it's, uh, but, but here I write uh, delta of xy, which is the integral kernel of this operator. Okay, now I come to quantization. So we have uh, the space of field configurations for a scalar field, and as this space, we use all smooth functions, not only solutions, all smooth functions. And we define observables as functions on the space of configurations. Yeah, so, so it's off shell. It's off shell. It's a so called off shell formalism. Which is, uh, of course, one could restrict oneself to, to a solution space, but this is usually more complicated. And it's uh, for the quantization, turns out to be much more convenient to use the off shell formalism. Yeah? And maybe yeah. observables within quotation marks. Okay. Uh, le, le, uh, I don't want to discuss a measurement problem. Yeah, it's just, I call it, it's just a name at the moment, yeah? But, but I think it's actually, the observables are constructed in terms of these objects. Yeah, and uh, which, how they can be observed is a different question I want, don't want to discuss. So these are just uh, maps on this, uh, on this uh, space of configurations. And of course, they are uh, rather, uh, a rather huge set. So let us look at special cases. So for instance, in Whiteman field theory, you are used to use linear functionals. So you just integrate the field phi with some uh, test density f. And you can then, of course, multiply these functionals in the sense of pointwise multiplication. So you get polynomials. And a uh, slight generalization is to look at polynomials of the field uh, in this way that you have the field at different points and you integrate it within the test density in n variables. And another class of functions which is very important because the interactions are formulated in terms of these uh, functionals are the local functionals. These are just uh, uh, defined in terms of a function on the jet space of M. And as a technical tool, we need differential differentiability properties of these functionals. So the notion of a the, uh, uh, derivative is very simple, namely uh, the nth derivative is just defined as a directional derivative, and we call the function differentiable if this nth derivative defines a symmetric distributional density. And there is some uh, further condition on the dependence on the uh, on the field configuration phi, which I don't want to discuss, but I think this is a Nowadays, a well-established framework of infinite-dimensional analysis. And psi is another test function. Hmm? Psi is, in this case, a smooth function. It's not, not necessarily compact support. But I assume that the, the functional derivative is a distribution with compact support. OK, now I can extend the, the Poisson bracket to the space of, uh, of this larger uh, set of, of functionals by the following formula. So the Poisson bracket of two such functionals, capital F and capital G, is just given in terms of this commutator function integrated with the functional derivatives of F and G. And this has all properties of a Poisson bracket and was originally be defined by Pyles, so-called Pyles bracket. Now, uh, we want to quantize this structure, so we use a concept of deformation quantization, which means that we look for an associative product, which depends on a parameter h bar, and which tends to the uh, classical pointwise product, the limit h bar to zero, and the commutator divided by i h bar uh, approaches the Poisson bracket. And there's a simple solution for this uh, in this simple uh, in this in this case, namely the Weil-Morial quantization, where you define the star product by this formula here. So you apply a formal power series of bidifferential operators to the 
a product of functionals at different points. And uh, then at the end, you uh, set phi 1 equal to phi and 2 phi 2. And this is to be understood as a formal power series in H bar. But of course, in case your uh, functionals are polynomial, this is a finite sum. Yeah, so, so for the uh, uh, polynomials, this is an exact definition. But in the general case, this is only a formal power series. So let uh, 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 let me describe it on a case of a linear functional. Then the star product is just the classical product plus in first order an h bar, a term uh, uh, i times half of the commutator. Now, what is bad with this uh, Weimarial product in quantum field theory? The, the bad feature is that if you want to extend this product from the linear functionals to nonlinear local functionals, then you uh, get problems. Namely, let me discuss it in the simplest case of phi squared. So phi squared integrated with a test density f is a well-defined functional. It's also differentiable. Everything is fine. But when you apply this formula, you get three terms. The terms without derivatives is just the classical product. Then you get the term with one derivative, which is OK. But then you get the terms with the second derivatives. And there you have to square this distribution delta. But delta is singular. And in general, products of distributions are not well defined. And actually, in the case of delta, you cannot help. There's no reasonable way of defining this square as a distribution. But now the positivity of uh, uh, energy helps us, as we know from ordinary quantum field theory. And we can also do this in this more abstract framework. Namely, we use the fact that this condition on deformation quantization do not fix the star product. We can replace the commutator function in this exponent by any distribution H whose antisymmetric part is I times the commutator function, because only the antisymmetric part is tested in the commutator. And if we do this, then we get a star product, which I called here on this slide the star H product, which is equivalent to the previous one. Namely, let us look at the operator gamma index H, which is defined as the exponential of h bar over 2 times the, the uh, this distribution capital H uh, um, paired with the second functional derivative. And then, so this is again defined in sense of formal power series, and uh, you can then easily check that the two uh, star products, the original Weimarial product and the star H product are related by this operator and also this operator is, a, is invertible so this is really an equivalence of uh, star products. But we would like to find a, a, a distribution H such that we can extend the star product to more singular uh, functionals. So we have a certain wish list for, for this function h. So we first, we require that it's a bi-solution of the Klein-Gordon equation. This is just nice because then the functionals f, which vanish on solutions, form an ideal in this product, with respect to this product, as in the classical theory. This is very nice because at the end, we would like to go to the on-shell formalism, where we divide out the ideal of functions vanishing on solutions. Then, in order to have a well-defined product also for local functionals, we want that pointwise products of these distributions exist. Furthermore, we would like to have something which is uh, definitely wrong for the Weimarial product, which, which can be required here. Namely, we require that H is a distribution of positive type, which means that uh, if I integrate H, with 
the test density F and uh, this complex conjugate ten test density F bar, then you get always a non-negative number. But H is not symmetric. H is not symmetric, no. H, but, uh, no this product is not symmetric, but okay. Um, it's correct, it's correct. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, what enters here is the symmetric part of H, because you have yeah. the same function on both sides. Yeah. So, so that's really positive. This is a requirement. And what is the consequence? If you use such an H product, then you have the nice feature that you immediately get a lot of states. States on this algebra are functionals which are positive in the sense that they assume positive values on products of uh, F bar F. And if you have this property, then you can easily show that uh, every evaluation of this function at a field configuration yields a state. These are just the coherent states. So this is a very nice feature of this one. It's a little bit like uh, when you pass to a Keller, uh, to a Keller structure. Uh, it's related to the Keller structure. Yeah, that's true. And furthermore, I have this requirement on positive energies, namely, I want that this uh, function H selects so locally the positive frequencies. And, okay, these uh, conditions don't come from the sky. It's just what we already know from the two-point function in Minkowski space. So we just want to save as much as possible from the situation we know in Mikowski space. There, the Whiteman two-point function exactly fulfills all these conditions. And actually, this transition to this new star product just uh, amounts to Wick ordering. It's just the Wick ordered version. Yeah? Could you also select locally equilibrium, some kind of local KMS condition, rather than the Positivity of energy. Uh, um, actually, the uh, KMS states with positive temperature also satisfy this condition. So instead of the Weidmann two-point function, you could also use the two-point function of a KMS state. They have to fulfill all these conditions. So locally, there is no difference between the uh, positive energy and the energy condition on a KMS state with positive temperature. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now I can dis uh, I, to discuss this condition. One uses techniques from microlocal analysis, in particular, one uses the concept of wavefront sets. So the wavefront set is a subset of the cotangent space. So the, the uh, commutator function delta is a distribution on the product of the manifold with itself. And the wavefront set is then a subset of the cotangent space of the uh, product of the manifold with itself. So there are two points of the manifold, x and x prime, and at each point you have a covector, k respectively k prime. And the wavefront set of delta, just because delta is a solution of the Klein Gordon equation, can be shown to be of the following form. There exists a null geodesic connecting x and x prime, and this covector k is coparallel to the tangent vector of this geodesic at the uh, starting point. And then you take a parallel transport of your covector to the other end of the curve, and you add it to the other vector, and this must give zero, so this is some kind of translation invariance or momentum conversation, conservation, if you want. This is the wavefront set of delta, and if you look at the wavefront set of the positive frequency part, it's just half of this, the positive half of this wavefront set. So you just have the additional condition that the momentum or the covector at the point x is future directed. And actually it's clear uh, because the sum, if you have a sum of two distributions, the wavefront set uh, is contained in the union of these two wavefront sets. So, so it cannot be smaller, yeah, because when you have this condition that two times the imaginary part of delta plus is just a commutator function, then this is the smallest possible wavefront set. Of course, you could also think of the 
negative sign in this relation. This would be, give the delta minus function, but delta minus, because of this minus sign, is not of positive type. So what you see is that these two positivity concepts, positivity in the sense of quantum mechanical probability and uh, positivity in the sense of, uh, of the spectrum condition, the positivity of energy, coincide for the scalar field. I know of no fundamental reason why this must be so. Actually, this is a great problem in defining uh, um, uh, free fields on curved space-time with half integer spin higher than one half. So there you get, get a lot of problems. Because this positivity issue is usually not, there seem to be no reason that this is related, but for the scalar field it is related. For the Dirac equation it works? For the Dirac equation it also works, fortunately. <laughs> okay, now this uh, 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 concept of the wave concept can then be used to define what is called the Hadamard function. This is due to Ratzikowski. And uh, so, uh, according to Ratzikowski, a Hadamard function is a solution by solution of the Klein Gordon equation, such that the two times the imaginary part is the commutator function. And the wave front set is just this positive half of the wave front set of the delta functions this is then called the microlocal spectrum condition and H is of positive type. But the wave from set is always pointing up in the future. Okay. Uh, not, uh, yeah, uh, uh, for, uh, it's, it's for, the, for the first entry. For the first entry, yeah. But it's, it's no space-like vector. Code. No space-like, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, actually it's light-like, it's light-like but future-directed. Actually, uh, this concept of the Hadamard function is older than the work of Ratzikowski, and uh, you can just try to find more explicit uh, form for the Hadamard function. So this form is given here. This is the form u divided by sigma plus v times log sigma plus w, where u, v, and w are smooth functions, and sigma is just the squared geodesic distance between two points. And what Ratzikowski proved is that his definition is equivalent to this definition. Actually, this definition has to be made more precise because you have to, to uh, discuss the singularity in light-like and uh, time-like directions. You have to say what happens if you are outside of, the, of a geodesically convex neighborhood and so far. So this is a very complicated definition which was fully spelled out in a paper by Kay and Wald. And it's a major technical advance that, that uh, this can be reduced to this simple uh, property of the wave front set. So this, actually this uh, definition of Hadamard solution in terms of microlocal analysis makes, uh, uh, it used a lot of uh, things which could immediately be done. So first, this was a construction of Wick polynomials on curved space-time as operator value distributions. So because you just compute correlation functions of Wick product, everything can be done in terms of this uh, distribution H and its derivatives. And you just have to see that all the products which arise are well-defined. And this can be done in terms of the wave front set. The condition is that the sum of the wave front set of the factors never should hit the zero section of the cotangent bundle. And this can be, a, it's just a consequence of this positivity condition on the, on the uh, covectors. For instance, in this way you can prove that in a Hadamard set, not only the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor is well defined, but even the correlations are well defined. So, so, so if you want to understand the back reaction by looking at the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor, you, of course you have to also to look for the fluctuations because otherwise the expectation value would be not of much, uh, much use. Uh, other aspect are the quantum energy inequalities, uh, originally proposed by a fault, 
but uh, uh, Fuser found that this microlocal spectrum condition gives a very uh, uh, important generalization. Namely, what one finds is the, the expectation value of the energy density in the Hadamard state is not necessarily positive. This is already true for the energy momentum tensor in Minkowski space. But uh, um, when you smear the energy, the energy density with the square of a real value test function, then it becomes bounded from below. And this can be shown in terms of these wavefront sets. And maybe the most important thing is that you can do, using these techniques, the ultraviolet renormalization of quantum fields during curved space-time. And this was done by Brunetti and myself and then completed by Hollands and Wald. And what about infrared? Infrared is a different issue. This is a different issue. Okay, so how is renormalization done? Now, uh, the method is based on the concept of causal perturbation theory as originally proposed by Stückelberg and Bogolyubov, and then worked out in all details by Epstein and Glaser. So the basic idea is that you define the time-ordered products of Wick products of free fields as operator value distributions on Fox space, and you require that these time-ordered uh, products uh, satisfy a few axioms. And the most important is that the time-ordered product coincides with the operator product if the arguments are time-ordered, so what you would uh, usually require. And then, uh, in the famous paper of Epstein Glaser from 1973, they succeeded in proving that solutions satisfying the axioms exist and that the ambiguity is labeled by the known renormalization conditions. And then you can construct the solution either directly, which is in many cases uh, somewhat complicated, or via some of the known methods, BPHZ, pauli villar momentum cutoff, dimensional regularization, or what's else. Now we wanted to apply this to curved space-time. This required a reformulation, which only uses local concepts. Before it was in a flat space. This, for, this was in a flat space, yeah. Now if we do it on a, on a curved space-time, so we cannot use all the techniques. So we have to generalize this a little bit. So we have, cannot have not this distinguished uh, representation on the Fox space, so we do it space free, yeah, without, uh, no refer without any reference to Fox space. We don't have translation symmetry. And uh, we need a new concept of the adiabatic limit because it just makes no sense to take the integral over all space time if you don't know what the situation at the end of space time is. And you need renormalization conditions which are in a sense universal. I will discuss what this means. Formally, what you do is you construct uh, an operator called the time ordering operator, which is formally given by this formula. So you take the Feynman propagator associated to capital H, which is just H plus a multiple of the retarded propagator. And you, uh, you have this pairing of this uh, distribution HF with a second derivative. And, uh, okay, I omitted here factor h bar, yeah, so you should think of a factor h bar and the factor of one half. And uh, now the question is how, uh, this is of course rather formal, so you have to, to see whether this can be made precise. And uh, it can be made precise as a map from the set of multi-local functionals to the so-called microcausal functionals. Let me briefly explain what this means. So we have the local functionals. We restrict the local functions to those which vanish at phi equals zero, so the constant functional is uh, not included there. Uh, and then the multi-local functionals, is just this, uh, this is just a unital algebra generated by the local functionals. And the microcausal functionals are those functionals which, where the wavefront set satisfies a certain uh, condition. Of course, this 
explains this condition in detail. It's maybe a little bit too complicated at the moment. Just remember that it's a condition just made in such a way that the products which arise are well defined. Just as an example, so we apply this operator to a simple multilocal functional, which is just the square of two uh, functionals of the form phi squared, integrated with the test function. And then we have uh, apply this operator, so we get three terms, just the uh, first term, which is a unit, then the first derivative and the second derivative. And the problem is again in the second derivative, because there we have the square of this Feynman propagator, HF. And, but the Feynman propagator is no, not a solution of the homogeneous uh, klein gordon equation. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a propagator, so it contains the wave front set of the delta function, which is just the diagonal. So the, the wave front set of the delta function is just uh, the diagonal uh, x, x. So two points should coincide, and the covectors have to add to, to zero. But all time now it's space like. Hmm? No, no, K can be arbitrary. All, all cases are admitted, all non-vanishing cases can be admitted. And then, of course, there is no positivity condition, and so when you uh, define the square, you can add two covectors and you get zero. And this is just uh, 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 shows that the, uh, in general, the, this is, uh, the, the square is not a well-defined distribution. But uh, this holds only at coinciding points. So at non-coinciding points, you are always in this situation then that you can use these positivity conditions. So this product is well-defined for non-coinciding points, but not for coinciding points. And this holds very general. And so what remains at the end, this is already in the framework of Epstein and Glaser, and, and the general case can be reduced to this, uh, is the following mathematical problem. You have a distribution which is defined outside of a submanifold, and you want to extend it to the full manifold, and you use something corresponding to translation covariance on curved spacetime, which is a technical problem, but can be solved. And, uh, so, so at the end, you, you get a distribution which is defined everywhere outside of a single point. And then you can uh, uh, discuss this extension in terms of the scaling degree, which was originally defined by Steinmann. So this is uh, the following definition. You just scale your distribution by some uh, positive factor lambda. You multiply the distribution by a certain power of lambda, and you ask that this uh, 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 sequence of distribution uh, converges to zero in the sense of distributions as lambda goes to zero, and lambda goes to zero. as lambda goes to zero. Yeah, and so you test the, the, the singularity as the origin, and and the infimum of these numbers is called the scaling degree, and then the theorem is that if the scaling degree is finite, then extensions exist. And moreover, extension with the same scaling degree, and two such extensions differ by a derivative of the delta function of order scaling degree minus n. So in particular, if the scaling degree is smaller than n, then the uh, distribution is unique. Uh, and if the scaling degree is infinite, then a T cannot be extended. So this theorem... I think this is due to, uh, to Veil. Uh, to? Veil. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure who first uh, gave a complete proof of this. So we were not able to find a complete proof. So it would be nice to know it. I think Andre Veil proved that. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, also for man sub-manifolds? No, for Ah, yeah, ah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so, so that's uh, <coughs> so this theory comp replaces completely the standard regularization techniques, but in order to get a specific 
extension, they are often useful. And uh, just to explain how this is related to standard regularization techniques, uh, um, the, the following consideration. So um, let's assume we have a finite scaling degree, but larger or equal to the dim uh, of the dimension. And then one can show that the distribution can be uniquely extended to all test functions which vanish at the origin of the order of the degree, degree of divergence, which is just the integer, uh, largest integer smaller than the difference of the scaling degree and the dimension. Then we choose a projection on the complementary subspace of the test function space. And then every extension is given by this formula. So we just take the composition of the distribution with the, uh, with the projection 1 minus w. w is this projection on the finite dimensional subspace, and 1 is the unit operator. And all extensions are of this form. Now, uh, such a projection has this simple form that it uh, can be written in this Dirac bracket notation as a sum over w alpha delta alpha uh, del alpha delta. So the functions w alpha form a basis of this finite dimensional subspace, which is just dual to the, uh, to the basis of the distributions uh, uh, arising from uh, derivatives of the delta function. So this means just that the derivative of w at 0 is uh, the Kronecker delta times some sign. Now, assume we have some regularization techniques. So we replace T by some sequence Tn. And we assume that Tn uh, converges to T on the subspace of test functions which vanish at the origin. Then Tw was defined as this composition of T with 1 minus W. Now I replace T by Tn. And then I can apply Tn to both terms uh, so first I apply to, uh, to uh, the unit, and then I apply to this projection W. And what we see is that we can construct this distribution as a limit of Tn, where we subtract certain divergent multiples of the delta function or its derivatives. This shows how divergent counterterms occur in this formalism. So it's just because you have this projection, but you cannot split it for T itself, but only for the approximating sequence Tn. So I guess you have, there are two Ns on your slide with different meanings. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, here, this is the index of the sequence. It's not the, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and this is now all on Rn. This is <laughs> not on a hyperbar. Oh, OK. So, so these uh, Ns are not related, yeah. <laughs> but your space time is now uh, an RN, or what? No, no. Uh, th so this was just um, the general comment. Of course, this is some technical problem to reduce this problem of extending distributions on manifolds, which vanish on a, which are not defined on a submanifold, to, to the situation where you have just uh, one point. So in a sense, you use some transversal coordinates near to the submanifold. Yeah. And that's me too. Yeah. Uh, that's the way uh, it can be done, but this is technically de technically demanding. But uh, I, I can uh, so this was done in this paper by Bonetti myself, and there is a recent PhD thesis by Viet Dang who analyzed this uh, from the mathematical point of view very carefully. But uh, at at the end you uh, arrive at this problem, but this of course requires some exercise in microlocal analysis. Okay, now we have all the means to construct this time ordering operator. So we look at the symmetric Fox space over the space of local functionals. So Fox space, not just in the algebraic sense, so it's not considered to be a Hilbert space. Just the sum of symmetric tensor powers. And uh, on this space, we have the multiplication map, which maps the space into the space of multi-local functionals. We define the n-linear maps Tn on the symmetric Fox space to the space of microcausal functionals just by using the 
this uh, bidifferential operator in terms of the Feynman propagator. And because we go to several factors, we have to use the Leibniz rule, and this creates this indices ij here. So this gives all the combinatoric of Feynman rules and so on. And uh, what is important is that this multiplication map turns out to be bijective. This is a little bit surprising because the, uh, in the Fox space you have functions of different field configurations and at the end you have functions of one field configuration. But due to the smoothness of the local functionals, so the local functionals are singular in, uh, on the diagonal but smooth along the diagonal. So they're singular transversal to the diagonal, but smooth along the diagonal. And, and this uh, then, then allows to construct the inverse of M. And at the end, you can define this time ordering operator just by the direct sum of these maps Tn composed with uh, the inverse of M. So this is the definition of T. And if you like path integrals, you can also formulate this as a path integral. Namely, it's just a convolution with the Gaussian measure induced by the Feynman propagator. But uh, uh, for the definition, this does not help because you have to do the same calculations. Yeah, so but you give the formula. But the, but the formula is there, so you see the relation. Yeah? So it's just a different different way of formulating this. Now we can define the time-ordered product. Namely, the time-ordered product is now just equivalent to the classical product by the time-ordering operator. This is formula written there. And so this is then this statement of this theorem, which of course contains as an essential point that this multiplication map is invertible. This was done together with Katarzyna Reisner. So, in particular, the time ordered product can be defined as a binary product of functionals, and this product turns out to be associative and commutative because it's equivalent to the classical product. Then we can define the time ordered exponential, which is just the exponential series composed with this uh, map T. And by definition, T acts trivially on local functionals. This means that we define our functionals uh, in the normal ordered form related to H. So if we change H, then we have also to change our functionals. Then we can define the interacting fields if we have some interaction L. And this is uh, something one might call the Muller map from the Fries to the interacting theory. And this is just Bogolyubov's formula for the, in, for the interacting field. So we take the S matrix to the minus one product, the time order product of the S matrix with the functional F. And this is well defined if T to the minus one of F is in this set of multi-local functionals. Yeah, so in general, there, um, uh, there could be divergences, but for this set, it's uh, well defined. Okay, then, uh, as I said, there is some ambiguity in the uh, in the uh, definition of time ordered products, and this ambiguity can be discussed in terms of the renormalization group in the sense of Stückelberg and Petermann. This is not exactly the same as the renormalization group of Wilson. So it's really a group. It's a group of all. Uh, analytic bijections of this space of local functionals. And uh, the crucial relation is that this is additive if these functionals have disjoint support. And the first derivative should be, should be the identity. And then there is something which was called the main theorem of renormalization, an unpublished paper by Stora and Popinot. And, uh, okay, there are different versions of these theorems with different generality. And uh, the statement is that if I have found such a formal S matrix, then any other formal S matrix S hat 
is obtained on the original one by composing it with an element of this group. So all questions of renormalization can then be deformed in properties of this group. So for instance, uh, anomalies and so on can be discussed in terms of the group. Okay, now... This is in a, in a curved space. Uh, Everything is in the, uh, this is in the, also in the curved space, yeah. yeah this is uh, very general. Of course, in flat space, uh, this is more or less what was known, but, uh, but uh, can be generalized to, to, to uh, curved space. Uh, now, there is, but there remains one ugly problem, namely, uh, when one does this renormalization, one has to do it for every point of the space-time independently, because there is no symmetry in general. So how to compare these uh, renormalization procedures at different points of space-time? And of course, there uh, is uh, some feeling how this should be done, so if you want to have an operation which is locally defined, but to make this precise is rather complicated. But uh, of course, this uh, problem would not ex uh, does not exist on Minkowski space. There you have a sufficiently large symmetry. You can have other space time with large symmetries where you have similar uh, advantages. But in the gener generic case, you really have the problem that, you, that it seems that you have independent conditions at each space time point, which of course would be very ugly. Now, uh, the solution of this problem is to construct the theory not on one specific space-time, but on all space-times in a coherent way. And this can again be formulated in the language of algebraic quantum field theory. So we generalize the Hakasler axioms in a uh, useful way. So uh, the idea is that we look at subregions as space-times in their own right. Of course, these subregions should be generally uh, should be um, globally hyperbolic, and the generalization is the following: so we associate to every globally hyperbolic and okay contractible, orientable, and time-oriented manifold of a given dimension, a certain uh, C-star algebra, or in perturbation theory we uh, restrict ourselves to uh, star algebras. For every isometric causality at orientation preserving embedding, we, uh, we have an injective homomorphism of the algebra of the region M to the algebra of the spacetime N. And these, uh, if you have uh, two subsequent embeddings, then this uh, homomorphism just uh, can be composed. And then we have some. Uh, condition of local commutativity. So if these embeddings uh, map into space-like separated subregions, then the corresponding algebras commute. And there is some dynamical law which just tells if the uh, image of the spacetime M under chi contains a Cauchy surface, then A chi is even an isomorphism. So in uh, the language of category theories, just tells you that the quantum field theory is the functor from the category of space times, with admissible embeddings as morphisms, to the category of uh, unital star algebras with injective homomorphisms as morphisms. This is a concept which was called locally covariant quantum field theory, and in a paper by, together with Rainer Ferch and Romeo Bonetti. And in this framework, one can define a field independent of the space-time. Namely, what is a field? A field is uh, just a natural transformation between the functor of test function spaces and the quantum field theory functor. functor. So this means you have a field phi as a family of maps, phi m, from the test function space of m to the algebra associated to m, and which transforms uh, in the appropriate way under these, uh, under these embeddings. And uh, so if you uh, 
uh, use this more suggestive notation here, you see immediately what happens if n is equal m, then chi, chi should preserve the, the metric, so it's an isometry, so it's symmetry of the spacetime. This just is the usual notion of a covariant field on a given spacetime. So this condition uh, contains the usual notion of covariance, but it's uh, valid in this more general framework. Now we can use this for renormalization. Namely, we define the time ordering operator as a natural transformation. And so this means if M is an admissible subregion of N, then the restriction of the time ordering operator uh, to Tm must coincide with uh, uh, the restriction of Tn to the smaller subregion must, uh, must coincide with Tm. There is a practical obstruction to do this. There is the fact that there is no natural Hadamard function. This is related to this problem that there is no vacuum state. And, um, but this uh, can be solved, this problem, and the solution was uh, in the uh, series of paper by Hollands and Ward. What do you mean it's solved? I mean, there is an ambiguity. No, no, uh, uh, the non-ambiguity is there. But you have to, in, to isolate the, 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 uh, the, the non-ambiguous. So the ambiguity is there, but you, the, the singularity, uh, so if you look at the form of the Hadamard function, there are some parts which are, which are non-ambiguous and there is the ambiguous part. And you have to show that what you do is, does not depend on the ambiguous part. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Actually, this is uh, quite demanding. It's not, uh, not, not an easy exercise. And the Hadamard function means which kind of propagator? Which? The Hadamard function just means that you have a certain wavefront set. And then, uh, but then the, I gave this explicit formula for the Hadamard function, which involved uh, these smooth functions u, v, and w. And it turns out that u and v are uniquely determined by geometry, and w is free. And you have to show uh, to, uh, to, uh, to say, to d discuss the dependence on w. That's, that's the, uh, what you have to, done, to do. Okay, now I, uh, up to now I discussed this on the level of uh, scalar theories. Now we can generalize it to Dirac, yeah? So removing these ambiguities, does that mean we can say what we mean by when we say that the coupling constants of a quantum field theory are everywhere the same. Yeah, so if, if, you, if you have a dimensionless coupling constant, this is everywhere the same, yes. Okay. This, would, this would be the statement, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> actually, usually uh, there remain some, some ambiguities. For instance, you have the coupling to the curvature, which is, can be tested, of course, only on a space with non-vanishing curvature. So from, if you start from Minkowski space, you cannot determine this constant. Yeah? So you have to, uh, but, but this is a finite number of parameters in a renormalizable field. But there also there would be a constant sign. Yeah, there would be a constant again, yeah. Okay, so Dirac and Johanna fields can be discussed. This gives no fundamentally new problem, but uh, you can make a lot of errors. Yeah, by, making wrong signs and factors, and I think it's difficult to find paper where all these signs are correct. And, um, but in gauge theories and gravity... Power of bi, as Feynman would mention. <laughs> Feynman never consider power of bi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So in gauge theories and gravity, uh, one has new problems because the uh, Cauchy problem is not well posed due to the gauge theory. And in classical field theory, you would... Uh, just fix the gauge. In quantum field theory, you uh, cannot do this directly because these things which uh, you would like to vanish have non-vanishing commutators or Poisson brackets in the uh, formalism of, of uh, canonical field theory. But can you just pass the Dirac brackets then? Yeah, okay. That's, um, the problem is with Dirac brackets is that the, the, the uh, singularity structures are uh, very difficult. <coughs> so, so I think this, uh, I have no, not any rigorous discussion of the Dirac brackets. In this so, so you say that in passing from Poisson to Dirac brackets, you, eventually, you potentially encounter a problem with uh, singularities. The, the problem is, uh, okay, I just don't know. 
So I have not found any place where this was treated in, say, say a sufficient generality. The problem is the following. Uh, all this uh, in quantum field theory, in, at least in four-dimensional quantum field theory, you always have to smear over space and time. Mm -hmm. You cannot do smearing only in space. This is, uh, creates singularities. But the, the concept of Dirac brackets is usually defined at a fixed time. And, and so, I mean, it's you know really standard thing. For example, when we pass from Dirac to Majorana fermions, that gives you just a factor of one half, and that's you know. yeah. So, 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 so for the linear fields themselves, this is uh, okay. The problem is if you go to nonlinear fields, because then you get additional singularities, and I just don't know whether this uh, can be done. Okay, but uh, uh, look. Uh, in Young Mills series, we know how to do it using for the Popov ghosts and anti ghosts. And we have the BST transformation. And you just at the end, we define the algebra of observables as a cohomology of the BS operator. And we can do, try to do the same for gravity. But in gravity, we have a problem. Namely, if we do this just in the same way as in Young Mills, we find that there are no. The cohomology is trivial because there are no local observables. This is a major problem. It can, in principle, be solved in the following way. Namely, we use the dynamical fields themselves as coordinates. This, of course, is not always possible. This depends on the, gauge, uh, on the uh, gravitational field. But for generic field configuration, this is possible. And so the idea is to you mean on shell? Uh, not necessarily on shell, just generically in the sense that there are no uh, special symmetries and so on. Uh, so that you have enough independent, uh, say, say uh, curvature scalars, for instance. And then you just choose such a generally globally hyperbolic metric and you expand then the extended action in, uh, around this uh, up to second order, so you get a free field theory. One can show that this has Hadamas uh, states. And uh, then one uh, adds the, the remaining term of the action, the perturbation theory, and constructs everything. And this has to be done in such a way that the BST invariance holds. And at the end, you prove that if you change the background infinitesimally, then the theory does not change. This is due to the principle of perturbative agreement proved by Hollands and Wald. And states can be constructed at the end by, uh, uh, um, if you start from a solution of the classical field equation and use this concept of coherent states around these. Okay, so I come to the end. So uh, I've tried to explain how this functorial approach to quantum field theory works. This was originally developed for the purposes of renormalization on curved space-time, but in principle it allows also a framework for a background independent approach to quantum gravity. Of course, this does not change this problem of non-renormalizability, which means that you can perform everything step by step, but you get new uh, um, uh, U uh, terms in the Lagrangian in every order. So in this sense, it's non-renormalizable, but uh, uh, I think there's, uh, uh, it's probably possible, nevertheless, to interpret this, uh, this theory in the sense of effective field theory. At the end, uh, actually, we have problems to see any effect of the quantization of gravity in experiments. So I think there is some hope that these effects are very small. So um, actually this is supported by work on the renormalization group in the group of Reuter and, un, and others. And um, it's at the moment these formalisms are a little bit too far from each other, but principle I think this can be compared to this uh, uh, approach of Reuter. There is one major, major lack in this uh, whole procedure. There's no, up to now, no application to physical phenomena. And this is due to one ugly feature, namely 
the restriction to generic backgrounds. Namely, if you want to have an explicit example, you typically use not a generic background, but you use some with background which has additional symmetries, and then you cannot directly use these, uh, these concepts. So in this case, you have to uh, use other methods. So one way out would be to add certain fields, like, for instance, the dust fields of Brown and Kutscher, uh, which have been used just for the same reason in uh, loop quantum gravity. And uh, so that, but this is work which has to be done, which was not done up to now. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, I have a question. I mean, this, as far as I understand, your approach is, relies very much on Epstein class. Uh, yeah. Now, in, in, in quantum field theory, in practical quantum field theory, Epstein class is not used very much, but people use dimensional realization. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, what would you advise, I mean, this is somehow related to the one but last point, if I actually want to do a practical calculation, how should I proceed? Yeah. Um, so, so um, okay. In uh, so, so when you do it on on uh, on Minkowski space, yeah, I think you can compare it only on Minkowski space, but on curved space time, there's not much, which was done in other formalism. Actually, I think no complete proof. I think the only proof for curved space time is in the Epstein Glaser framework. But uh, but in the but in the um, on Minkowski space, Epstein glass is just equivalent to other methods. So um, uh, you are use the method which is most uh, useful for you. So there are certain cases where uh, where um, this Epstein glass method leads to shorter calculations, but there are also cases where it's more complicated. So I uh, I think I would. Uh, actually, what we analyzed was how to use dimensional regularization in the framework of Epstein Glaser. This gives, us, this gives a position space version of the dimensional regularization similar to what was already, um, uh, not, not really the same, but, but uh, it's the spirit of some work of uh, Bolini and Gambiacci. But, um, but you, you uh, but you can also use other regularization methods. So that's not, uh, yeah. So I have two questions. I don't understand the last problem, but you yeah. know, maybe that's too technical. I don't know. The other question is: Is there any kind of Wilsonian version of the renormalization group that I could use to analyze these field theories? Of course, the na naively doesn't work because usually Wilson needs momentum space, but maybe there is a more clever. Yeah, so, so in principle, you can actually, uh, what, what you can do is you can replace what I uh, call this time ordering operator. You could replace this by some more regular object, for instance, just by uh, re uh, approximating the Feynman propagator by something regular. And then you get, uh, you are just in this uh, Polchinski version of the Wilson renormalization group. Actually, this has already been analyzed in a paper by us. So you really get the flow equation in this framework, but you can, so, so, but, but uh, you can use any, any approximation. So, of course, momentum space makes no sense, but you can use just something. Yeah, yeah that's uh, just, uh, which, I, th I think uh, might be a problem for the interpretation because you uh, you are free to use any, for instance, you can just look at a sequence of test functions which converges in the sense of distribution to the Feynman propagator. Mm -hmm. And then you... Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a related question uh, in a sense, uh, because for me it's not obvious that in general the renormalization group uh, a la Wilson, the Wilsonian renormalization group, will be related to the renormalization group in the sense of renormalization of the theory, the reduction of ambiguity, which are the free parameter, etc. Yeah. So in your case, what you define as a renormalization group is clearly a group acting on ambiguities. Yes, okay. yes. Is there any uh, way you could see that it has something to do with uh, Wilson renormalization group and change of scale? Uh, yeah, it, uh, you can see it, um, but the connection is not as close. Yeah, so so so. Um, so what you can do is you you can um, 
you can discuss it in terms of these um, these um, uh, um, okay um, <clears throat> So, so you, what you can show is that in a certain sense, the, the Wilsonian renormalization group converges to, to, to the right thing. Yes, so you, you, have, uh, you, you, you use some regularization, you get, you get your, your um, um, re, um, um, regularized time ordering operator, you have your regularized formal S matrix, then you compute an element of the stöckelberg petermann renormalization group related to this transformation. And then you can show that in a certain sense, this, uh, these uh, uh, products converge. But I think the, these, the statements which exist at the moment are not very strong. It's related to the, to the uh, question whether this perturbative calculation of the coefficients in the renormalization group gives the right answer for the Wilsonian renormalization group. Mm -hmm. I think that usually uh, in the calculation you usually neglect certain terms which you consider to be irrelevant. And I think that's the question how far this is justified. I, um, I think this answer has been given to my knowledge only in very special cases. Particularly only for renormalizable theories. theories. So that would be my belief. The relation only exists for the musical theories. There exists a relation, but I think the problem is the relation, as far as I know them, are not very strong. There's some similarity, but it's not exactly the same. In, last question. In the case of quantum gravity, does your approach give a, a better uh, definition of what would be a quantum back reaction than the? <coughs> Your G0, you say G0 is off shell whatever, but at some point you want a good G0 which incorporates back action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there? Does it okay. help or not? Okay. Thank you. That's, of course, our hope. I think we are not so far. So, so we, we hope the formalism in principle should give it, but when we, uh, so, uh, so what one should compare it is, uh, one should compare it with the so called semi classical Einstein equation. The semi-classical Einstein equation has a problem that, a consistency problem. It's experimentally shown to be wrong. It's so. <laughs> <laughs> a proof experiment. Okay, let's uh, maybe stop here because we want to go. Thank you.